The time duration for the session is approximately 1 hour 15 minutes, which includes the opening and closing remarks by our distinguished moderator, deliberations, addresses, presentations by all our eminent panelists, which will be followed by question and answers in the end, if the time permits. And now for the session on universities, the hub of knowledge and tech innovation. I hand over to our distinguished moderator, Mr. M. S. Bala, co-founder and chief strategy officer, Ken 42, for your opening remarks, sir, and to kindly carry forward the proceedings of this session. Over to you. Uh, welcome to the very interesting panel. Uh, I was expecting the hall to be really full, but we have very few folks here, but still I think the message is going to be carried very strongly with an, one of the best eminent panel we have here. Uh, so universities hub of knowledge and tech innovation, I think we are at the right time. Uh, in fact, the new educational paradigm change is happening everywhere. Today, the students of today and tomorrow is no more what we have seen uh, two decades ago or even a decade ago. There is a totally, uh, uh, there is a huge change and the ubiquitous technology transformation that has happened not only just in the education but also the modality of running the institution or you know, uh, 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 writing the assignment or assessment. I think everything there is a fundamental uh, shift has been seen across the industry, right? So the students face different pressure, continue to face a different pressure more on the uh, looking at the wider life goals, uh, especially the, the flexible approach to the education and where the courses blend towards the traditional lecture and uh, the classes on online study and where more uh, popular modularity study programs uh, allow for more professional journey through and higher education. Having said this today, uh, I would like to wanted to quote one example which I have actually underwent a few years back in a California uh, State University uh, in Northridge in the United States. Um, so there was a trialing courses where the course was taken both online as well as uh, two classes can coexist parallelly. So that helped the University of Manchester Manchester, which is part of the university, uh, the learning essential in initiative using a technology that actually deliver the curriculum linked programs, uh, uh, the online resources over 10,000 students across 70 course units will drop the worksheet and face to face session backup. This is one live uh, example where I could relate how the transformation of technology can change the whole paradigm. Right? With this example, I just wanted to touch upon uh, the, 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 uh, the ground reality. So today we talk about employability, right? So end of the day, all the institutions have to be successful, right? How do you measure the success, right? So you will be looking at the student's placement. They could be a job seeker or a job giver, whatever. That's why we call knowledge and innovation. We are, we are combining both the topics, right? So the industry is looking from employability to deployability, right? So today, no more employability. We want the, 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 the hires to be deployed. There used to be volume hiring, but today it's a value hiring. Totally the, the paradigm shift has changed. There used to be a days where people used to you know, uh, train a lot and then hire them. But whereas today it is, I mean, hire, hire and then train them. But today it is like we, we, uh, we, we hire the candidates who have been well trained. So this is the fundamental shift that has changed. So having said that the new educational policy, I can't uh, no, uh, f f finish my opening remarks without touching upon the first educational policy, which has a lot of great things, a lot of transformations been seen. In fact, even before the panel starts, we've been having uh, a very quick discussion about exchanging thoughts on uh, the national educational policy, which is unprecedented allocation of 6% of GDP towards education, paving way to a transformation uh, uh, both in the school education as well as higher education to make India global knowledge hub. Today you look at the you know, characteristics of the students, right? Uh, the 2021 was educational change of the year. We all should agree, right? So the global situation, it has changed. But then it remains to be facing a real paradigm over the next two, three, four, five years or even a decade, I would say. That's why we kept 2030 as a target for achieving the national education policy. When you see the hub and hub of knowledge and tech innovation, these are the, uh, uh, the, the the terminologies that strikes me, right? How the academia, industry, government, startup ecosystem should connect towards, right? That's what the panel is going to talk about it. So every each one of us come across the curriculum aspect, the teaching and learning evaluation, research consultancy extension, right? The intra and learning resources, student support progression, governance, leadership. So the combination of all these things, which every institution, every university 
university undergo so we put it in this very very powerful topic the no hub of knowledge and tech innovation and i just want to touch upon quick couple of points the, the gen z characteristic of students is totally different right so to, they need immediate response uh, uh, in fact the survey says every student get distracted every 8 seconds right uh, so they have a multiple resources facts versus opinion uh, construct versus instruct uh, so generally special specialist so a lot of things been very very difficult paradigm the whole industry whole academia the industry everybody are undergoing so are we ready is the question mark are we ready to move the flexible approaches are we ready to have the blending traditional uh, on campus learning with online delivery uh, are we ready to have a mixed digital assessment with tailored individual study path so these are the questions that's been among all of us right how are we going to address this how are we going to talk about i mean, in fact we want to grind down the challenges that what the industry the academy is looking at and find out a right solution that's about the opening remarks and this panel is going to be very very powerful panel with mr dr g ravichandran provost of geo institute uh, we have dr shekhar sunadan from vit uh, uh, professor dr uh, deeraj sanghi vice chancellor of jk lakshmipati university we have dr uh, uh, sashi prabha vice chancellor of satyabhama institute of science and technology and mr Mr. Heman Shahal, founder and CEO, uh, put your hands together, welcoming the panel, and we'll start the uh, panel discussion. All right. So I just wanted uh, each one of you to share a quick perspective. What it means to you, the hub of knowledge and tech innovation. Probably you can take a minute or minute and a half to share your perspective before we get into the uh, question, focus question. So this is a very interesting topic, and uh, you know universities are known as the universities are known to be the creators of knowledge and uh, knowledge for the ages. But at the same time, there is also responsibility for the society to the society, and you know you want to innovate. So there, the the mindset is, you know, what is knowledge is the creation of new new information, because sometimes the information you teach in the class is not necessarily translated into knowledge, but you want to create new ideas, new innovations, and that's what you know you hope to achieve with the students. For that, you need to give the students a set of tools, and it's not necessarily going to go from knowledge to innovation and for that you need you know critical thinking and uh, that kind of the mindset you need to do so what i would suggest is that there is kind of a paradigm shift from being just learners to critical thinkers i think that's what would uh, transform this uh, idea of going from knowledge to innovation and there are many other factors one could consider in making students equipping students with this and perhaps we'll get to this sometime later yeah a uh, university is a hub of knowledge and innovation uh, so university is there are three main roles that a university uh, offers one is creation of new knowledge which is research then transmission of new knowledge which is what education is all about and then you know helping the industry with solving problems consultancy and so on or applying that knowledge uh, these are the three things that a university should do and what is interesting is you know till uh, nep 2020 Uh, the government was always talking about every university doing everything you know the, the ugc will talk about you must publish papers you must do this you must do that but nep at least has started talking about different universities could be in different leagues there could be research focused universities which will also do teaching of course there are, there could be teaching focused universities which could do little bit less of research or you know and then there could be some colleges which could only do teaching but of course nep is talking about those colleges being phased out by 2035 or 2040 or something so i think uh, we now have a much better handle on this this issue of uh, where each college or each university should stand in terms of this hub of knowledge uh, concept is there uh, whether we i i want to be a big creator of knowledge or i want to be big transmitter of knowledge uh, and i think there are a lot of universities which need to be just transmitter of knowledge and i have you know today at least after nep 2020 i have no shame in saying that my university should primarily focus on being transmitter of knowledge and to smaller extent focus on creation of knowledge and i would have been very ashamed of making this statement 2 years ago but today i can make this statement with pride excellence so good evening 
So the question is very interesting question. The universities are the creation of knowledge or hub of uh, technology innovation. The question is actually carrying a lot of meaning. So earlier we were concentrating only on research. So research is giving a knowledge. So the knowledge cre creation is happening in the institutions through the research culture. So it has, of course I can say it has matured. And almost all the institutions, or all the top ranked institutions are doing good research. So they are creating good knowledge and it is getting published and uh, they are uh, globally ranked and nationally ranked. That is going well as of now. But towards innovation, we need to really look into. Innovation in the sense, we have to develop a lot of products, innovative products. Disruptive innovation needs to come out of the institution. That is happening in Indian institutions or not, that is a question mark. That is not that happened, I hope, according to my knowledge. There is no disruptive innovation that has come out of any of the institution in India. But if you say the innovations like internet or any vaccines or all, all those innovations, most of the innovations which we are using now are evolved from the institutions in developed countries like USA or UK. If you say the polio vaccine, it has come out of the institution. If you see the alphanet, that is the basis of internet, has come out of the institution in USA. So like that, our institution need to concentrate on innovation. That's why our Government of India, Ministry of Education, with the support of AICT, is really doing a hand-holding exercise that they have developed a policy, uh, NASP, National Innovation Startup Policy. So through that policy, I think most of the institution have started implementing it. They have made a, a policy framework and they have asked a policy document from the institution and at least one percentage of our annual budget needs to be allotted for uh, investing or encouraging startups in the institutions. So this is what we need to concentrate and uh, this session is going to focus on innovation rather than creating knowledge that is happening but disruptive or breakthrough innovation needs to come out of the institutions for the technological need of the nation and to the globe. So uh, my interest towards this session is that all the institutions, all, all the academicians who, who are, are the administrators who are here needs to focus in strengthening the innovation ecosystem in the institutions. And you have got a Yukti portal. I think our uh, Ministry of Education and AACT has developed a Yukti portal. Uh, please go and deposit all your innovation. Encourage your students to deposit their ideas, prototypes, or the proof of concept, or the products, or the startup companies in various levels of TRLs, technology ready readiness level from 1 to 9, they can deposit in their Yukti portal. So this is the encouragement, or it's a hand-holding exercise our ministry is doing with us. Let us uh, uh, go it forward, let us keep it forward and uh, complete this type of exercise with the support of the student community and the faculty community. At in our institution, we are encouraging the students to start their own companies and we have got a startup cell, we have got an incubator, incubation, technology business incubator, with the support of DST, with the support of uh, uh, MSME and we have got a technology transfer center which is actually supporting the student innovation to go into the next level of commercialization. So thank you for the opportunity. So thank you. Um, good evening. So <clears throat> what it means to be a hub of knowledge and uh, you know, improving the tech innovation. I, I think um, uh, as my fellow panelists have already mentioned, um, you know, by being creator of knowledge, and I want to emphasize on sharing of those uh, of the knowledge, uh, creation of knowledge through research, etc. But uh, um, transmission, and I'm talking about sharing of knowledge. So universities need to start sharing of the knowledge with uh, the community within as well as communities outside. Um, so I think th that is the most emphasized part for me uh, to share the knowledge. And of course, uh, promotion of innovation eventually leads to entrepreneurship. I I'm sure we are going to talk about uh, more topics later. For now, I'll stop and then pass it down. All right. Uh, so I think knowledge creation happens uh, purely by research, but when it, we talk about innovation, 
it's constraint of resources most of the time that creates you know brings in innovations but there's no constraint on thinking so a point on how do we actually build that culture in institutions around free thinking and that flexibility i love to delve on that as we get into our panel discussion all right i think pretty much everybody you heard the answers that the innovation knowledge of hub is towards uh, they've shared their experience in terms of the faculty in terms of innovation in terms of technology business incubators which is good so now the question is how do you ensure your ecosystem your institution ecosystem is up to the mark in achieving the outcome based education right so all these terminal is what you all have been mentioning be a critical thinking or setting up the technology incubator or using very is schemes of the union government i think pretty much it's all every everything is good to have but how different your institution is in terms of achieving the outcome based education what outcome based education means to you and how do you measure the outcome based education in terms of knowledge and innovation that's the question uh, probably we'll start from uh, mr shaker um <coughs> so what i would consider as um, outcome i mean we we measure our institution success with the success of our alumni uh, for uh, students who graduate so you know we we are proud that uh, we are we have created a system which encourages uh thinking uh, i'm i'm hoping that i can say the word free thinking but probably we are not there yet i mean there are uh, constraints and restraints uh, but we have to work towards uh, as hemant was saying free thinking in the institution and allowing students to uh, do a fail you know because many people are afraid of failure so how do you fail fast and fail cheap so that's one of the things which which the uh, students need to learn in the uh, university so that uh, you know becoming an entrepreneur becomes easier at a later point of time you know st the student age is the age you can uh, do many experiments and you have that boldness you have that fire in your belly but once you go into employment many people start losing it so that's the time you can encourage innovation and uh, so my my feeling is that you know the outcome uh, um should be measured based on the uh, what the graduates are going to be doing whether they are going to become great entrepreneurs or you know great corporate achievers and many more things so that's my take on this thank you i think that's a brilliant point i think uh, having the alumni ecosystem is pretty very very important uh, you mentioned that uh, very well point taken as well like fail fast fail cheap i think these are all like very very important for the institution uh, my question to mr deeraj uh, in following with outcome based education where do you see the outcome based education is actually evident right how i mean you have any use cases to demonstrate hey this is what outcome based education means yeah so i think i'll go with shekhar in saying that you know outcome based education of course we all have gone through with this nba nac etc and we all fill up those files uh, i mean those are fraudulent things right uh, i think at the end of the day what shekhar says that outcome based education should show up in terms of our alumni doing well our graduates doing well uh, in short term as well as long term and i think that's where uh, alumni connect becomes extremely important because that's the feedback that i should have on my courses uh, the problem with that is that this feedback loop is becoming very long so if i'm going to say that you know 5 years after you have graduated how are you doing and then i'm going to take feedback then say 10 year long feedback and that's the problem with education everywhere it's not just and it's an unsolvable problem in some sense so you take feedback every semester you take feedback from all your stakeholders and everything and then you and that's where the role of f faculty and the academic administrators become extremely important because you have in some sense an unscientific feedback i mean you you're not taking feedback 10 years later sorry uh, and how do you make sense out of this somewhat unscientific feedback and say you know how, where where should you what should you change in your curriculum what should you change in your program what new program you should have so that your alumni will be successful 5 years 10 years from now is 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 a problem and in fact this is something that i've read that you know education is often uh, behind industry for the same reason i'm going to start looking at a new program in ai only after a lot of people have started talking about
about AI, right? Which means that when AI becomes important, at that time there are hardly any people who are doing that. I will start and program in AI this year and four years from now they will uh, get into the market and then they, they will take another two, three years to get kind of trained in the industry and by then AI may be over. Right? So this is a problem and really I don't think I have a solution except saying you know we will have this uh, whatever limited feedback we can keep getting every semester from recent graduates from current students and so on and, and go with your guts. No, oh, thank you. That that's really helpful, uh, Dheeraj. Um, uh, I would like to shift the point to um, uh, the other speaker. Uh, he comes from most of his life. He lived in the United States, and he has a different perspective on outcome-based education, where actually OBE evolved out of the other side of the world. So I would like to hear your thoughts. What OBE you have seen all these years, and I think you are four months young in India, right? Uh, after your uh, uh, professional accomplishment. So I would like to hear from you. Uh, so first, uh, before I address that question, you know, a couple of things I'll mention, because you know I'm a product of the Indian education system. I got my undergraduate degree here. Uh, so what I can say is, you know, what is really critically missing is that we need to equip the students with the right tools. I think the right tool, but when I say the right tool, in order for you to innovate, you know, you have to promote curiosity and imagination, and that's the the mother of all inventions, the curiosity. And that can be done only through, you know, proper educational tools. And what is really needed is that you have, because, you know, we are very good at producing analytical uh, thinkers. That What I mean by that is that they can solve differential equations and so on. But what we are not good at is this doing what, uh, you know, what my colleagues call the free thinking or the unconstrained thinking. I think, you know, I will add one more thing to that is that the tolerance of ambiguity and that is something you know very low in our in our in our system and I think that is you know that would create a system where you can see things from many points of view not just you know one one dimensional thinking and I think this is very critical and to measure you know what's the outcome you know when you say that you know the rightfully uh, Dr. Vishwanathan said that you look at our alumni and you know what they, what they have done but you can also so one can see immediately whether they are willing to go to the real world and take risks and you know the risk taking is something which you know again sometimes we are averse of but you know we can see that sign immediately almost immediately and our colleague uh, here from Colpol you know he is one of the people who really went out and immediately took that risk and I think that is one of the measures one can use. I think that's really interesting answer, Mr. Ravi. Um, so instead of asking the same question to Sashi Prabha and uh, uh, Hemant, I'll just move on to another uh, question. Um, how do you see the faculty members, basically the faculty development programs playing a very, very important role? Uh, today, the students are very smart. For example, I'll give you one example. In one of the institutes where I'm the chairman of an insti government institution, the full stack is very, very hard topic, right? So today, students know what is full stack and they are hands-on. Probably the, the faculty members may not have an hands on experience on full stack, right? So that's where the faculty development program comes in. I just wanted to hear from uh, Sashi Prabha as well as from Hemant. Um, where do you think this faculty development program can actually be transformational? Where it can, it makes sense for the students to really, hey, to go ahead with the student, to the faculty members and ask questions and ask, solve the problems. How, how do you, uh, where do you think this is heading towards? Because, see, we are uh, starting new programs, new courses, and the faculty members remain the same. So we need to upskill the skill set of the faculty members periodically. So continuously, any faculty who is competent enough to handle the new subjects can able to survive in the institutions, as mainly in the private institutions. Because the demand for the faculty who is always uh, uh, having the learning capability is uh, uh, appreciated and they'll be rewarded and uh, they'll be given good honorarium in any of the institutions. So nowadays, all the faculty members, most of the faculty members institutions are given the equal opportunity to empower themselves because without their empowerment, we cannot able to impart this type of outcome-based education to the students. So outcome-based education mainly deals with 
there's capability improving the capability of the students either engineering or arts or commerce or management whatever may be the field whether we are really importing the skill set of the particular field of studies if it is engineering whether we are whether the student is able to solve engineering problems or whether he is able to identify the problems or whether he is able to investigate the problems in the nearby society or in any field of uh, is uh, specialization so this type of uh, knowledge because the faculty the when the faculty is able to import this type of uh, uh, sessions to the students only because then they need to be uh, capable so that so that's why the faculty development program is very very important and mainly the assessment processes so not only the empowerment we need to assess the students when we need, when we need to assess the students the faculty should be able to give that type of questions to the students and once the students are answering those questions the the faculty is capable of evaluating their answers so the faculty empowerment is very very important to assess the students to teach the students and it is very very important in the entire teaching learning process and by improving the teaching pedagogies so the just to improve their innovative pedagogies that we are actually giving lot of sessions to the faculty to through the faculty development programs continuously even for the new faculty or the experienced faculty so this is going on in every institution that is very very important and only then we can able to really achieve the uh, practice of obe in the institutions yeah uh, sure so i think before i answer that question uh, very proud to say i am an alumni of eit university which did actually promote free thinking at that point uh, and uh, uh, so to answer that question uh, you said see i would first answer it saying even before we go to the faculty one of the things i feel is missing is that most of the higher education institutions don't really delve too deep into what is their aspiration what is their vision who do they want to be because what kind of faculty do they attract and retain would actually automatically get aligned once institutions and their leadership know what do they want to do do they want to be a research centered university do they want to focus more on imparting and there is a debate on whether the two can actually be separate but you know my belief is they can be to some extent uh, independent and are you actually talking about undergraduate education or postgraduate education because to me you said what do you look at a faculty as if i look back at the faculty who really made a difference in my undergraduate education i don't even think of what they taught me my focus is i really look upon the faculty who were very friendly who guided me who mentored me and had nothing to do with the subjects they were teaching me so faculty means very differently in undergrad education and very differently in a maybe a post graduate specialized education so one institutions need to be very clear what are their goals aspiration who they want that's one second i will relate to then the faculty development you mentioned uh, how we hire in the startup world right we don't go for the skills first we say hey what is the company's goal is this person that we want to bring on board does he or she align with those or not first of all right second is there a cultural fitment good bad ugly every organization has a culture and the person i'm trying to bring on board does that person align with my you know the culture of the organization and third is obviously competence what role am i bringing them for or which subject what area am i bringing the faculty for and do they have the competence in terms of research in terms of experience or not and if you do that by default see faculty development program every institution is already investing in it but if you don't have the right set of faculty which aligns with the institution's culture vision and what subjects then automatically there is going to be misfit and if we can sort that thing first i think there are institutions which i know are automatically attracting some of the best faculty members faculty members are going out on their own to upskill themselves and the first piece is i think far more important to sort and then the second uh, falls in place by default that's helpful lehman thank you uh, i just slightly move on the topic towards uh, the industry academia uh, government and startup ecosystem right so having said that today um yeah 
So having said that, the industry academia ecosystem, other than the placements, right, which most of the institutions more worried about the placement. We come and say that, hey, so many students have been hired, this is the highest, uh, lakhs per annum is the salary. I mean, that's important, I'm not denying it. We always look to be a job seeker. We never bother to be a job giver. That's the trend that we wanted to uh, trans see the transformation. So when you say industry academia ecosystem, what is that you think it's very important which is missing now? I think other than the placement, what is that you think that it's very important for the academy and the industry collaboration, right? We talk about research, policy, framework, but is it in place now? Are we really heading towards, are we really focusing towards achieving that research policy framework? That's a question probably we'll start with uh, uh, Mr. Ravi and then we can move on. I think, uh, you know, it's uh, what I call a triple helix. The triple helix is essentially government, industry, and academia. I think they have to, all three of them have to work together. And uh, so this, uh, you know, particularly talking about the industry and academia relationship, you know, this is always uh, kind of a puzzle for me. Because see, the people who work in industry were at some point in the university system and then they went to industry. But there is still a wide gap between industry and academia. And this can be bridged, I think, you know, some of the new regulations which are coming out, like the professor of practice and other things, you know, these are beginning to bridge that. But many times the faculty themselves haven't spent any time in the industry. So, you know, that creates a lot of issues because, you know, there's a lack of understanding. So you need to meet somewhere in the middle in order for you to, to create this. But eventually, all these things boils down to people connection, you know, one-on-one -on -one connection, whether there is a champion in industry and there is a person in the university who understands the industry needs. And, the, you know, that's how you can promote this uh, collaboration. You know, without that, uh, nothing is going to happen. And what the universities offer to industry are really the facilities and people and also the, the people, you know, smart young people who are thinking, who are curious about working on problems. And these are things, you know, which we need to continue to cultivate to build this bridge and also remove the kind of the trust problems which, which may exist from time to time because this has to also be viewed as a long-term relationship, not, you know, just in a year things don't happen in a university, in a university research kind of environment. I think that's something important to keep in mind. Yeah, I think when we talk about industry academia interaction, uh, what is missing in India is research, research and consultancy. Uh, you know, we, we have heard that uh, the faculty members don't know about industry. How are they going to know about industry? Now, yesterday also we had a FICI event about this part and people said, you know, there should be reverse internships, faculty should just go and work in industry for two months and so on. I don't think that's ever going to be practical. I think if the faculty member does research with industry, if it does consultancy with industry, he will know what industry wants. Very clear. Okay. Uh, I think the gap between academia and industry when we talk about that in India, it is really in terms of placement, unfortunately, that my students or my recent graduates are not employable. Now, yesterday also we had this discussion in which I said, look, the solution is what? Or, or the prognosis is what? Prognosis then comes is, oh, you guys don't know anything about industry and therefore you are not teaching what is industry needed. Right? And yesterday in the meeting I said, look, this is a wrong prognosis. Why is it wrong? It is not that I am not teaching what industry wants. It is because I am not teaching anything at all. And unless you understand this prognosis, you will not be able to solve the problem. So, for example, I come from computer science. Now, industry tells me, does your student know Python? Does your student know R? Maybe not. But I will say, if I, if I, if I taught C, if I taught, forget C, if I taught COBOL, I don't know how many of you ever heard of this uh, programming language called COBOL, which was popular in the 60s, right? If I teach somebody COBOL today, I know how well I can teach that in two weeks time he will learn Python and R, and R, right? So the problem is not COBOL versus C versus Java versus whatever, the problem is I'm not teaching anything at all in the industry. The industry people tell me, and there was a survey three, four years ago, 99% of my IT graduates, CS graduates from all over the country cannot write a long program in this country. That is the problem, not about, you know, what is the curriculum. So the gap 
can never be filled and it cannot be filled and it should not be filled so in yet another event last week where which was between computer science faculty and uh, it industry i said you talk about i'm not doing your job okay you are 10 people in the room can 10 of you sit down right now and agree on one thing that this is the programming language i should teach and you also promise that four years from now you will ask questions in this programming language in your uh, interview if you can agree on this i will promise that i will teach that programming language in my curriculum but industry is not monolith and academia is not monolith so when we talk about gap it is bound to be there because neither you are monolith nor i am monolith and between a diverse set of re, uh, industry and a diverse set of academia there will be gap there is this is the definition so therefore please don't try to bridge this gap certainly we won't <laughs> okay that's a nice uh, i mean the sa on the same line i just wanted to have a little twist to the question why the always the academia the colleges institutions wanted to hire a lot of industry folks not on others wise why the industry is not willing to hire any academicians on their thing right why don't you think is it possible right so what do you think about it so depending on the quality of the faculty so if the the faculty is updated with the latest uh, cutting edge technologies surely even now the faculty is moving to industries so that is depending on the individual so not on the entire faculty we cannot blame so if the faculty is really updating themselves and they need to have a shift to the industry they are moving now also even the fac experienced faculties are moving to the industries not on the development side at least in the research side they are moving to the industries so to bridge the gap between the industry now every institutions in institutions interested to host the industry inside the premises so start the centers of excellence or innovation centers so wherein the faculty members and students will work for their projects as a consultancy work or as internship a uh, intern they will also get their manpower to work on their projects without any cost or even if they want to pay little any meager amount to the students they will be very happy to take it so these type of arrangements if all the industries are thinking then surely this gap gap can be fulfilled because yeah, our yeah, universities or institutions are open and inviting the industries to come to their campuses and build this type of uh, ecosystem and students are more interested to participate and faculties are also more interested to participate like a consultancy project or any kind of engagement either teaching learning or we are interested to teaching their faculty in terms of some softwares or matlab or any kind of development program executive development program or any kind of programs our, our faculties are institutionally interested to collaborate so this type of uh, uh, mutual agreements or mutual benefit if the industries are coming forward surely we can fill this gap so, yeah. No, very uh, thought-provoking uh, <laughs> views from Professor Dheeraj. Uh, anyhow, uh, no, I got reminded of one incident. I, I was visiting uh, the world-famous uh, Purdue University. I'm talking about a decade back. There, I went to the uh, mechanical engineering department, and I saw that uh, they had got doing a consultancy project. You know who the client was? TVS Motors Hosur. TVS Motors Hosur brought their engine to Purdue University to solve an engine design problem. I was thinking, I am in Vellore, VIT, which is just 180 kilometers from Hosur, but TVS is going to Purdue, which is like thousands and thousands of kilometers away. So I came and talked to my faculty, and actually I told them, certainly, the, the, I think the major issue is lack of confidence in the faculty we have. So I said, let's not blame the industry. You go and demonstrate. It's not that you are any less compared to the brains they have in Purdue or brains they have in TVS. It's just that you have not explored that part. You have to wake up. You have to focus on those. I mean, I think one philosophical issue which we are talking about is about the industry versus academia. Uh, you know, you are talking about why wouldn't industry hire from... I think there is a huge cultural difference. I mean, let's not uh, say industry culture is bad or let's not say academic culture. It's two different cultures, two different worlds. But these two worlds are actually dependent on each other. They are uh, co-dependent. Interdependent. So, industry needs academia. Academia also needs industry. So, we should learn to live with each other. We need not be the same. 
we need to learn with uh, the so there are many ideas ma'am also uh, mentioned about some so the point i wanted to make is uh, especially indian industry one thing which we can do is spend more on r and d which is not happening i mean in developed nations many of the industries spend a lot more on r and d so that's an excellent avenue to collaborate with education institutions uh, you know that has not happened so much in india i think as india grows that's bound to happen because right now a lot of technologies are just imported you know we call it the screwdriver technology right we <laughs> just get everything put them together and sell it that needs to change when that changes i think a lot more uh, industry consultancy through academia is going to happen and academia also needs to extend the hand you know we should not be sitting on ivory towers and because i have worked in the industry a long time and i am in academia so i know the different worlds but it's easy to bridge provided there's a opening of mind and i'm sure it's going to happen thank you so uh, i'll quickly just add to two thoughts here so one of the I, i and that's my personal opinion i think one of the reasons why industry academy collaborations uh, always uh, are like have been weak is because they are too transactional i don't think we need to build any bridge between industry academy what we need to do is we need to actually start breaking the the walls it needs if you go to a, a good top university in the us the way industry and the people interact with university is very free flow you will a lot of times find like you know people hanging around in their canteen students talking to them is a free flow what what happens in in a lot of indian institutions is you would see only them like when they are invited for a guest lecture or when they are visiting for hiring it's too transactional there are too too many gates there and one of the best ways we could actually build is when industry and academia generally like each other they like hanging around with each other and which does happen by the way you know for example dr krs murthy uh, who was the i am bangalore director he was on our board for a long time and there were several people and you know including mindry and uh, mr subrodo bakshi spoken about it that he had a challenge and he immediately went to him and said this is my challenge how do i solve it and he brought him to all the top leadership and they had a chat and it did resolve the problem and why did that happen because these two gentlemen generally liked each other they used to talk to each other and consult each other right so that has to increase the industry and academy need to generally be more you know in touch be connected and not just be transactional because most of the time it's only about either you come to my guest lecture give me a feedback come to for hiring and the other way where in industry will only reach out to an institution when they need to hire Uh, or probably so that's my opinion we need to be far more open to each other and like you know connect far more openly well said hemant uh, before we open up the floor to the questions and we will have a fireside chat uh, but i wanted to touch upon a very important topic i think that's how the hub of knowledge and innovation gets connected so the country has been focusing always on uh, teaching all these years right now we have moved towards learning so the teaching experience and the learning experience which actually derived the personalized experience so that's how the whole industry is heading towards be it technology or the pedagogy personal experience is what aiming at so this is the measurement of students experience so i just wanted to hear from the whole panel members what students experience means to you and where do you think the students experience benefits the whole ecosystem over a period of next few years we will start from uh, uh, mr uh, ravi yeah i think this is a very important aspect of uh, learning is that you know we give the students as i mentioned alluded before we give the students the analytical intelligence but we are not giving them the practical intelligence so what i mean by that is that you know we give them a problem they solve the problem you know whatever that may be you know whether it be in heat transfer or in writing a code or whatever but you know we need to be giving the students the tools to learn in a way in a kind of a open ended way in the sense that there is not a unique answer so because they have to be able to come up with different solutions i mean you know the example i give is you know bunch of lego blocks you give a, give a child 
and the child doesn't build just one thing and different children will build different blocks uh, different structures or things like that so you know the same way there is not a unique solution and that is one of the things which uh, industry faces is that the problems you face in industry are not what you learned in the textbooks so i think they should be able to deal with this kind of uh, ambiguity and uh, do that so you know we need to give students this experiential learning where there are not post a definite with this definitive answer but they could explore you know what's what's possible uh, okay yeah uh, so i think my last answer would have given some uh, misunderstandings to people saying you know i may not be interested in uh, industry academy interaction so let me just correct that uh, what i meant when i said that don't bridge the gap i meant that industry has its own strength we have our own strength there is no reason for us to say you change and there is no reason for them to say we should change and i think we can still do a lot of work together in fact i come from a university which has been set up by corporates jk group and the number of professors of practice even before this ugc thing has come is probably as a percentage of total faculty that we have is probably the highest in this country i don't think uh, the the kind of number of people whom we invite as professor of practice is is really really large uh, now coming to this question about student experience so i think uh, you know some of the things that uh, ravi mentioned in terms of let's say experiential learning we really need to understand this project thing very well and you know uh, at 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 my university jk lakshmi pati university in 2017 we started a transformation of the university and we said project based learning is going to be one of the pillars because that's where student experience becomes much better and the first thing we said is what is the gold standard of project based learning in this world and then we f found out about this olin college near boston and we said okay our faculty is going to go to olin college spend time there learn from them and we will invite faculty from olin college to jaipur and learn and there are so many things that we do differently right uh, for example how does a project based learning work in a typical college and in fact in that typical college i will include iit kanpur my previous institute you know first day of the class i will say this is the project to be done and i'll go to you know uh, look at this project 3 months from now and of course i being a very good faculty a student friendly faculty i give my phone number to them you can call me even at midnight if you have a problem in doing this project and nobody calls you right uh, just before that 3 months are over you send an email saying hey guys i hope you have finished your projects and i'm going to have this presentation next week and suddenly next day uh, there is a line uh, outside your office saying sir this is the problem that's the problem we are facing and we have been working on it for 2 months 3 months and so on right this is how projects happen now when we went to olen we learned so much research has happened in project based learning how do you form groups what kind of projects how do you how do you say the should the project be very tough very simple how should you monitor the project and we learned that project based learning is a very very expensive way of learning okay and we decided to invest in that why is it expensive because the project based learning will only work if the faculty is meeting the groups maybe twice or thrice a week not once in a semester or twice a semester but twice or thrice a week which means that your cost of education becomes multiple times of what you were doing earlier and our university is willing to invest that kind of money i don't think any university invest that kind of money right so but we do and i think that has improved the student experience there are several other things that we do for improving student experiences huge number of electives i think students really design their own degrees uh, we we offer free courses on coursera to all our students and but i think another important way in which student experience improves is we really let the student run the university students are members of every committee including the highest academic body which we call academic council students are members of you know board of study students are members of department councils students are members of everything not just they run their own clubs and they run their own sports things but they actually almost run the university that is when they learn leadership that is when they uh, and you know it, it 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 really helps us i'll give you this one very small example till 2 years ago hostel accommodation was decided by a faculty and every time students will complain this that sir ye nahi hua wo nahi hua now we said yaar let student decide how the hostel rooms are going to be allocated 
Now it's between students, they will fight it out. I, no complaint will ever come to vice chancellor. Right? So it actually helps a lot to the administration that students are running the university. Thank you very much. So good question. Student experience. The joy of learning should be there. So if you want to have a joy of learning to the students, the monotonous way of teaching the students is not required now. Because whatever we are teaching the, from the textbook, it is there in the Google. So they can learn from Google easily. So they are actually uh, expecting more from the textbooks. So the teacher should be having that much kind of uh, uh, knowledge to impart the concepts of this particular subject to the students through various modes. Like Sarah was mentioning about experience learning, project-based learning. So these are all the new innovative pedagogies. So these pedagogies, if they, we are giving to the students, so instead of uh, teaching a particular concept, the concept can be taught with the use of these problems or some kind of projects work if you are giving or through some designs, students will be more interested to learn and they'll make, uh, they'll feel this learning very interesting and joyful. And nowadays, we are practicing this type of uh, pedagogies in at least 50% of the courses are covering this type of pedagogies and we are making them comfortable and we are making them enjoyable in the campus not only these courses now I, I told uh, the, uh, the startup culture the students are coming out with the various uh, different type of uh, innovative ideas we are conducting pitch decks continuously a lot of events are happening pitch decks startup summits innovation summits and we have different clubs in the institutions so we have around 50 clubs in the institutions students are involved in those those clubs and uh, doing and trying to solve some of the issues of the society and they are going to the schools adopted schools adopted villages so in that way we are engaging students and we are making them uh, enjoyable and and the campus experience will be good for them in that way the institutions are moving forward and only then we can able to uh, bring more students to the campus uh, because the monotonous way of teaching is no longer uh, is uh, uh, sustainable than these institutions. So the concept oriented uh, teaching should be there and practical should be more and these type of experiences, community internship, industry internships, we can take our students to the um, rural villages and find out their problems and they can develop some solutions. So a lot of schemes are there, through the schemes we can involve the students and 50% of the time we can, if, if we are involving them in this type of uh, direction towards experiential learning, then they'll be very happy and uh, they'll make the entire process interesting. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, student experience. Now, I, I usually tell our faculty we exist because of our students. Right? So, it has to be a student-centric world for us. Um, so, if you look at our core values of VIT, we say student focus. That's the first core value of our university. So, uh, because I'm saying this to our faculty because sometimes we forget. We think uh, in a very different way, but, uh, you know, the students have also changed, you know, the, every generation it, it keeps changing. You know, you know, if you are not doing well as a faculty, it's going to spread in social media immediately. So, <laughs> you, you, the student feedback, you know, is very quick. So, you know, we have to learn to adapt and adopt. Um, that's the generic point which I wanted to mention. The other point is about, um, I also tell the students that what you learn outside the classroom is more than what you learn inside the classroom in the campus. There's a lot students learn from each other. The peer learning is heavy. You know, the, the networks they build, uh, you know, there are so many things informally they learn in the hostel or in the, you know, the tea shop near the campus. There's a lot of learning going on. Now, that's a huge difference between a campus learning and a online learning, right? So, the point I'm making is the student experience needs to be wholesome, not just what happens inside the classroom. So, an university ecosystem needs to facilitate the entire ecosystem of, you know, the uh, feedback of the student experience. So you need to have, you know, good, of course, what is given is a good infrastructure. You have good hostels and good classrooms and good labs and all those equipment, that's, that, that's a given. But there's a lot more you need to do to enhance that student experience and the expectations have grown, right? 
Students are no longer in small islands. They are all well connected. A student in US, a student in Japan and student in India can talk to each other. So they know the best practices across the world and the expectation is going to be there. So it's up to us as universities to fulfill and exceed those expectations. I'm sure we can work towards it. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, to me, two things very important from a student experience. One, student genuinely feels respected in the campus, whether it is academics, it is the hostel experience, it is extracurriculars. There is a gen, because a lot of times the student can't differentiate, have I really come out of school? Or am I really in a college? And, and that graduation, so universities and higher education institutions need to genuinely make the student feel respected. I think that's number one for the student experience. And second is how do you make every student believe that they are unique and there is a path for them and how do you support guide and inspire them to set, like set themselves on that unique path meant for them. Whether it's flexibility in academics, whether it is flexibility in terms of giving them time to do different things. And, and I relate a lot to it from my uh, undergraduate experience where, you know, I would need certain freedom uh, to go and, because I started uh, my first company a decade and a half ago when I was at VIT. And the f I needed a very different journey than what a lot of my other friends were doing and, and I did get that and I probably that helped me get where I am today. So s that's very important. Often times 80% of the student have to follow 20% of the other students because that's set as the right standards which is get good marks, get a placement with the top like package because those are the standards and there are several students who might not be meant for that path but we are forcing them. So those are two things important to me. One, making every single student feel respected. Second, making every student believe they are unique and they need to go and chase what they are meant for. And that's what student experience means to me. That's, uh, thank you, Hemant. So before we open up the question, let's have a quick uh, fireside answer with all the panelists. We'll go from there to here. I'm going to share uh, uh, three answers. You're going to choose one uh, uh, with, in relation towards the hub of knowledge and education, and it's your personal choice what you would think. It starts from Hemant. Admission placement culture. Culture. Uh, Shaker. Assessment leadership design thinking. Uh, leadership. Innovation, invention, curiosity. Innovation. Sir, innovation. Okay. Blackboard hybrid on um, online. Hybrid. Okay. Self accreditation, accreditation body, affiliation. Accreditation. Accreditation. Okay. Again, we'll go from there. Hey, man. Book, iPad, laptop. Uh, book. Okay. Criticism, creativity, feedback. Creativity. Okay. IQ, EQ, SQ. Intelligent quotient, emotional quotient, social quotient. EQ, that is also very important. Okay. Yes, Identity, recognition, appreciation. Appreciation. Okay. Chivangam, candy, chocolate. Chocolate. No, that's not the answer. I'm a question. I'm <laughs> Adaptive culture, risk taking, fast decision making. Risk taking. Risk taking. I think we should put your hands together for answering very quickly. I'm sure all these terms matters a lot for hub of knowledge and uh, tech innovation. Uh, so I, before I give the closing remarks, I'll open up the floor uh, uh, to ask questions to either to the whole panel or to any of you, please. Can we get a? Ma Why don't you come here? My name is Ashish Kumar and I represent an organization called Grand Thornton. My name is Ashish Kumar and I represent an organization called Grand Thornton. This is one of the consulting firm. Uh, so a lot has been, you know, said on the industry, uh, you know, academia collaboration part. Uh, so I manage the industry academia for a university. I just want to share a very candid feedback, sir. Where the problem lies. What I believe is that, uh, you know, uh, the problem is from the both sides. In our traditional, uh, you know, systems, we didn't have any, you know, a department or, you know, function which manages the industry, academia collaboration. The only problem lies today is who takes the first step. The corporate has their own style of working, their own ways of working. And on the other side, the universities has their own, uh, you know, you know, patterns of working. So, what I want to, um, you know, make point here is that, uh, you know, we just need a constant persuasion. 
from the both side, be it from the industry side or from the college side. This is my humble submission, Harris. Thank you, sir. Well received. Yeah. Next question. Yeah, I think we need questions, right? Uh, uh, suggestions and feedbacks most welcome over a dinner, but uh, we need to on questions. Uh, hello, uh, this is going to be a question for sure. So I've, we have very distinguished uh, panelists here. So my question to you is, uh, how many of you uh, celebrate failures in your universities when students fail? Great question. Celebrate failures in your institution. Yeah. Uh, good question. So that's what we are working towards. I, I would call it as work in progress. Uh, <laughs> I cannot say we have achieved it, but at least, see, uh, in, in the parts of where the entrepreneurship, you know, for example, we, we have, uh, at VIT, we have uh, set up uh, a student startup venture fund now. Uh, we have given one crore rupees, and we are going to eventually make it as five crores. But uh, as an entrepreneur, we want them to fail and learn. I mean, not want, they can afford to fail and learn. So we are working towards it, work in progress. Really interesting, yeah, over there. Yeah, yeah hi. Uh, my name is uh, Mohit. I'm representing Wellinker Education. Uh, my question is to Mr. Sekhar. Uh, he mentioned a very interesting uh, example about Purdue University and uh, TVS Motors. So after that, uh, were you able to build that confidence in the industry and uh, were any automobile companies uh, uh, came to your uh, this thing for uh, innovation? And another question is to Mr. Hemant. He mentioned that he, uh, there is no need to break the bridges, just uh, there's a need to break the walls. So can you give some examples of uh, global best practices, how those uh, balls, walls were broken? Because in Indian context, industry academy is uh, basically limited to internship, placements, projects here and there. Thank you. Good, good question. question. Of course, we haven't uh, reached the level of Purdue where we can get the projects uh, which go to Purdue, but we have made a lot of progress where the industries are approaching us uh, for, for example, the uh, electric vehicles, uh, battery design, uh, even the entire EV uh, design. So there are so many industries now are approaching uh, faculty and to a great extent we have improved, but we are not there yet to the extent of people traveling thousands of kilometers to solve their engine problem. Not there yet. Uh, yeah, so I, I'll quickly answer that uh, question that you asked. So, so I think the answer is very simple. Uh, you know, there's a concept of dating before you marry in a lot of places or culturally, right? So I think one of the things that has to happen is that the industry and academia need to do a lot more dating, right? So because we work as Coalpool with almost 150 plus institutions across the country, now every time I go to a city, in my mind there is always a professor I have in mind saying, hey, I need to go and catch up over a coffee with him, right? Or her. And, and that's where what I mean mean that you look forward to catching up, talking to each other, right? And for example, I always say like, I and Professor Sanghi have been in some of the panels and I've always enjoyed listening to him. So whenever I'm in Jaipur, I will make sure I ping him, I want to catch up with him and that needs to happen more often in industry and academia, where people first genuinely know, like each other, they are talking to each other and ideas would emerge and they will collaborate because tomorrow, let's say I have to hire, I'll go to the institutions where I know professors, I am, and I would believe that, okay, the students are going to be better because, you know, I know the professors there. So that's one thing and as, and I visited a lot of campuses like I was in Boston long back now I, after I started I haven't really uh, traveled a lot but you would often find you know uh, startups visiting there and then for example a lot of the professors in Stanford can get you an investment from a venture capital fund by just a single email because they are respected that heavily by the by the venture capital funds and they've got you know and so there is that genuine affinity and like so that's one example which I said how do you create more ways for people to, one opportunity is this, maybe, and yesterday we had a round table where probably it needs to be the format and other things will evolve over a period of time, but that's I, I, the one way at least I have seen uh, that ha happening a lot more often. Okay, we have here, gentlemen, we have one, okay. We'll finish with the last two questions. We'll go, go ahead, please. Uh, uh, very uh, good evening. Uh, this is Manish Gupta from Baba Freed Group in Punjab. So my question is that uh, from uh, the morning, it has been listened that uh, reskilling will be the new normal. Fine, and uh, might be the uh, students 
or is, uh, when they are in job, they get be recycled after every year. So how, my question is that, ki how should university impart the psychological strength among the students? That is my question. Ki that how they can cope up with the, uh, the new normal that is reskilling. I think I will, I will just take up this probably you can add up. I think the fundamental shift, the STEM education where science, technology, engineering, mathematics is slowly shifting towards STEAM education, right? The arts is another element which is getting into the STEM education. That makes the fundamental changes in making the, addressing the psychological aspect of the students. This is my take, but I over it to the rest of the three panel members can share. I think I think Mr. Bala gave a very good answer. I think one of one of the things which needs to go in is you know more emphasis on the arts, humanities, social sciences, because you know people always say the STEM is enough by itself, stand by itself. But if you look at it, the way people synthesize data and analyze data varies from discipline to discipline, even within engineering, sciences, all those things. So this brings, you know, having this arts, humanities, or this kind of things, you know, brings a different point of view, you know, different kind of thinking, different kind of solution. So I think this, you know, has to be more interdisciplinary, more involvement of arts and humanities. Thank you. We have one last question from the side. Yeah. Okay, we'll finish with it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Mohammed Awis. I'm from Egypt, and I attend your summit. It's very interesting to me to know how you are discussing together in this platform. And I have, I wonder actually, because we believe innovate or evaluate. And India, we consider India is one of the great nation. I mean, compare this with other developing countries. And uh, I miss in your discussion how we learn your experience to go back and to say in India, the industry is in communication with universities. Universities are doing well in research. And you do this and that and that and that and that. What I notice is you are very good in discussing many good points. But I don't learn a lot of things what I have to tell to my people. So please, if you could tell us how you integrate with industry. Mother companies, they don't need in universities. Mother companies, they have their own solution. They don't need our solution. So scientists are somewhere, somewhere away from what's going on in the world. So please comment on that, and otherwise we talk later on. Thank you very much. Thank you. What was the integrating industry with academic? Right. Yeah, uh, Professor, some of, I think uh, Madam mentioned a few, but let me add a few. Uh, for, for example, uh, you could bring the industry experts to teach one of the module in your curriculum, in each course, as much as possible. So the advantage is uh, when they uh, go there, the students get to know the latest in the industry, and the industry also understands the academic world. That, that's one way of integration. The other uh, best practice is in every board of studies, you know, the designing of the curriculum, you can have an industry, uh, one or more industry members sitting on the curriculum board. So uh, they give valuable inputs. So the third way is, uh, as Madam was mentioning, labs. It's labs and centers uh, where the industry gets involved in uh, setting up in the academic uh, institutions. And the fourth thing which we talked about is uh, consultancy. Uh, actually, it becomes um, two-way traffic, as I mentioned, but I would like the academia to take the first step and go and talk to the industry and say, hey, what are your problems? We can solve these problems. These are our expertise we have. And we can have many events where the industry is invited as, you know, that's just an excuse to get the people in. You know, Hammond talked a lot about social, social uh, socialization also. So those are all many uh, best practices which we do in India, which uh, I think uh, will be of uh, use to you. Thank you. Thank you. So I have one final question to all of you. Uh, assuming your chancellor or your chairman is good. One more question. Okay, finish it. Sorry. All of you. Um, mine is not a very tricky question. Um, uh, this being uh, a, a conclusive part, 
Uh, my question uh, is to bring out a positive note from all the leaders there, which might be a very small sp spark for all of us here. Up. So my question to all the leaders is, what is the, the best innovation from your home that you have looked up to? From your institution you have looked up to? The, the best innovation till date. You can start from that side. <laughs> okay, um, I'll just go with that. So I'm some, some also part of the academia. Uh, sector specific uh, focus in innovation will help the students to build. I think most of us reflected on center of excellence, uh, focusing on particular thing. I think that will help the students, the particular uh, institute student to focus on a thing instead of rather hanging around everywhere. So I would expect that each institute, like how for example STPI has a center of excellence everywhere. So I think focusing one sector specific innovation would drive the institute and be the best in it. That's how I look at it. So I think breaking down a complex problems into simple ones, you know, how you teach that, I think that's something which we emphasize in a kind of a multidisciplinary setting. So I think I'm going to talk about two things, not one. Uh, one is that we strongly support student mobility. Uh, right. You know, almost uh, we encourage all our students to spend a semester elsewhere in other IITs, IIITs, other good universities, and so on, uh, both in India and abroad. Uh, and you know, we encourage it so much that uh, you know, unlike many other places, we will not charge tuition in that semester for ourselves, and we don't want them to pay tuition at two places, right? And we really believe that this kind of exposure to another place both culturally as well as we are a small university we cannot offer all kinds of programs all kinds of courses so you know the student gets enriched the number two thing is you know we all talk about interdisciplinarity and so on but I think the level to which we have taken interdisciplinarity in our uh, curriculum so we have three disciplines engineering management and design irrespective of what program you have you have to do courses from all the three disciplines as well as you have to do one course every semester in every program in social sciences right so we don't have a social science program per se but every student in the university whether bachelor's master's engineering management design they have to do one course in social sciences every semester that's the level of interdisciplinarity that we have taken our university Yeah, the question is very tricky question. So she has asked the what innovation, the best innovation which is coming out of the institution, every institution she is asking. So I hope uh, the answer for her question is every institution, at least one innovation per year is coming out of the best institution in India. Surely we can say we are, we are making India. Innovation in the sense, not only in engineering, any field of science or in innovative drug molecules. If I say Satyabama Institute of Science and Technology, so we identified four new novel drug molecules for Alzheimer's disease. So that we are going to uh, transfer that molecule to the uh, pharma industry for the next level of clinical trials. So like that, every institution needs to come out with some kind of innovative outcomes for the benefit of the society. So that's for her question, I think. Thank you. Um, you know, as I was thinking about it, there are plenty of things which are going on in my mind, uh, but you asked for only one. So I, let me say something which we are very proud of. It, it's not an academic innovation. Um, we have something called as STAR scheme, support the advancement of rural students, where uh, we uh, identify from each district of our state one boy and one girl uh, who comes from a village background and studies only in a government school. And we give them complete free education, boarding, lodging and everything. And that we think is the best innovation we are proud of because now we have done a survey and found that many of their uh, the graduates are earning 10 times or 20 times what their parents are earning and they have done amazing things working for even Facebook in California coming from a s small village in Tamil Nadu so that's the innovation we are really proud of thank you
So uh, I, I, I'm not part of an academic institution, but uh, from our company, at least I'll share is one thing, one, it's not really an innovation, it's a very simple thing, which is important is that everybody, at least, and I'm talking from our organization perspective, everybody has a right to have an opinion and uh, express it on anything that's happening in the organization. So whether it's an engineer has an opinion on how our branding looks like or a, our creative team has an opinion on how the product works. So, and especially connecting to what Professor Sanghi mentioned long back is, uh, one innovation I'm seeing these days, at least at institutions, is how students are given that opportunity now to have an opinion and act, express that opinion on anything that's happening in the institution. And they're not just the consumers, but they are also now have that you know, opportunity to, whether it is how, which courses are being taught, so students can question why this elective is offered and why not this off elective, or why are we setting up this lab? Are we setting it up because of the for the creative marketing reasons, or what benefit have we got out of it? Oh, we have a you know business incubator, but what has ever come out of it? So, are we letting the students uh, you know have that opportunity and being heard and actually some action is one area. Uh, some of the best institutions we work with, we are seeing that happen. As in. Right. So, in next 70 seconds, we'll, we'll have the closing remarks very quickly. So, one last question to all of you. If you were given an opportunity by your chairman or a chancellor to have this position, which one you'll choose? Chief Campus Officer, Chief Innovation Officer, Chief Fund Officer, which one you'll choose? Fast. Chief Fund Officer. Shaker. Chief Fund Officer. Chief Innovation Officer. No, fun. Innovation. innovation. I think this is the final end of this uh, hub of knowledge and innovation. What it finally derives, I think you all know. You all heard it, right? So I think the student centricity, the student's experience, right? The transformation is what coming from the student centricity. I think with that, closing note, thank you so much for uh, being patiently listening to the panel at the last uh, session of the day. And thank you, my dear panelists, for having a brilliant sharing your views. Thank you so much. No PowerPoint. Exactly. Thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen, especially to our eminent panelists, our moderator, for making it a fun and interactive session, we must say. Thank you very much indeed, sir. And ladies and gentlemen, we now close the proceedings of this session. Uh, may I have the kind attention of the students present here? You are requested to proceed towards your coaches to leave the venue. And all our guests and delegates, participants, are requested to meet at the food hangar for networking. We have arranged for some drinks over there. We would request all of you to kindly join us at the food hangar for networking. And from 7.30 p.m. onwards, we will have the awards presentation ceremony, which will be conducted in the hall on my left hand side. So ladies and gentlemen, once again, all the students are requested to proceed towards their coaches to leave the venue. All other participants are requested to join us in the food hangar. And from 7.30 p.m. onwards, we will have the awards presentation ceremony in the hall on my left hand side. Thank you. Looking forward to seeing you all for the awards presentation ceremony, which will be graced by the Honorable Minister of State for Finance, Government of India, Dr. Bhagwat Kharadji. Thank you.